Hi. Uh, so I'm Doran Barton. I, uh, I'm a, uh, a Perl developer at Bluehost, where I work on their billing system. And uh, I've been using um, Linux since 1995, and Unix since 1990, 91, something like that. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm talking about Shorewall. Who's, who's used Shorewall at all? Who's heard of Shorewall before? Okay. <laughs> all right, let's go ahead and... Okay, so Shorewall, um, its job is basically to make it easier to manage all the various Linux kernel networking features, uh, namely things like net filter and IP tables, uh, IP route, it also gives you some uh, some capabilities of managing your uh, VPN if you use your firewall also as a VPN server. And it has some support for um, bonded interfaces, which means if you have, um, you can use multiple uh, Ethernet interfaces to create kind of this one massive parallel um, Ethernet virtual interface. So, um, for example, if you have four gigabit interfaces, you can create a virtual four gigabit interface with the bonding. And, the, and Shorewall helps you do that. Uh, it also lets you do balancing, which is nice if you have a, uh, an ISP that will give you two DSL connections, for example, and lets you treat them as, as one virtual connection. Um, but, you know, with Utopia and, uh, and, and Google Fiber coming, why would you need to? Why would you need more than that, right? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the one question that always comes up is, you know, there's plenty of tools out there that, uh, you know, there are plenty of man pages and how tos on on using NetFilter and IP tables and so forth directly. Well, <clears throat> the real advantage for Shorewall is that it lets you uh, manage your firewall rules in the way that you would express them as policy. If you are a network administrator at a company or at your home, um, you don't think, okay, well, I want to make sure that port 22 is open on ETH1 uh, from this IP address or whatever. You say, I don't want any traffic from you know, the wireless network in my house going to this website, or I don't want incoming traffic, you know, you, you, you basically delineate everything into zones. Uh, so go ahead and let's go to the next, next page here. This is, uh, this is meant to confuse you and frustrate you uh, to give you an idea of how IP tables and chains, uh, the, the way the IP tables um, works. Uh, let's see if we can walk through it real quick, just as an example. <clears throat> So over here we have inbound traffic. This is traffic coming into your into your Linux server. Um, there may be some mangle rules here that uh, that change change the packet uh, contents. Um, um, after that, it goes into the the NAT chain, which the NAT chain is responsible for network address translation or masquerading. Then. Um, we have, this is if we're doing some forwarding, like a port forwarding, that goes over here. And uh, the alternative there is uh, if, if, it, if the packet is destined for a process on the Linux server itself. So if you have like a web server running on your firewall, then it comes down here and you've got all these other rules that apply to it. Here's your local processes down here spinning. And, uh, and then uh, up here is a routing decision, so this is where your packet is determined to go t out on this other interface. So, for example, you have this interface is, is connected to your modem, to your ISP, and this interface is connected to your local area network with all your other machines. So that, that's handled here. Which interface is it going out to? And then the outbound traffic goes out through here. There's some, some other rules that affect, that m might change the, uh, the contents of the packet. When you're writing IP tables rules, you have to understand that whole flow. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to get yourself into a situation and say, I don't know why it's not working. Well, then you learn how IP tables works. This is a, a, an example of some IP table scripts. Um, Red Hat uh, and CentOS 
uh, have something similar to this. They have it where they, they break off some of the stuff where they're not calling IP tables every time, but it, it, it's more like a configuration file. But essentially, every line is some kind of an IP tables command that affects the contents of a table or a chain and uh, uh, says, okay, well, you know, like down here, we're allowing port 20 and 21 from ETH0 uh, to allow FTP. Uh, down here, we're allowing stuff on port 22 for SSH and so forth. Um, it's all very, very uh, detailed and very specific. And that's a very simple... This is just a snippet yeah. of what your average <laughs> firewall script would look like. Okay, let's go to the next. Okay, well, what Shorewall does that's novel is that it divides, uh, it divides your network, not just your network, but everything that your firewall is concerned with into zones. Uh, in, this, in this diagram, this gray box over here is the firewall. And some of the zones, the other zones that it's concerned with, are these other boxes here. So up here we have a zone called, you can't read this very well, it's the net zone. So this is the this is the incoming traffic from the internet, or the traffic that you know when you're browsing the web from your local area network. That's where that traffic you know you, your requests are going out to the net zone. Um, let's say you have a local wireless network, and you want to control it uh, separately from other things. This is uh, a lot of companies do this. They'll set up like a captive portal uh, where you have to log in to the, uh, uh, an open access point. And then you have to log into some web page before you can get access to the internet, that sort of thing. But in that case, you want to treat traffic from wireless uh, clients differently than other um, machines on the network. So we have a, a separate, in this, in this example, we have a separate uh, uh, Ethernet interface on the firewall that is connected to the wireless access point. So that is treated as its own zone. Um, people that are connecting into the firewall via VPN, you can treat those as, as a separate zone. And then you have your local um, local zone, and they say the local wireless clients, VPN clients, but anyway, these people are connected to the uh, uh, ETH1, anyway, we can call that as a, a separate zone, and then down here we have a DMZ, a demilitarized zone. This is where you put uh, servers that, that you want people from the outside to be able to access, but you want to put them in a zone where they have a restricted um, access to like domain name servers. Um, you vary, uh, you're very uh, strict in what ports are, can go in and out so that you don't have, uh, because they're, they're, sure, they're, they're sitting inside the building, but you don't want them to ac be able to access anybody in this other zone. You know, you don't want them to be able to see traffic that's going between your, you know, desktops and, and your file servers and things like that. So you put them on a separate interface and you call that the DMZ zone. So then what Shorewall lets you do is define rules of what traffic can go between each of these zones. Okay, let's go to the next, next slide here. So any questions about what Shorewall does? So this is how you get started. You install it. On a Red Hat, CentOS, or Fedora system, you just use yum, do a yum install, shorewall. On uh, Ubuntu, you do an apt-get install. I was actually surprised. I, did, I thought that for a long time that shorewall was a Red Hat only uh, party, but uh, it is available for other uh, Linux distributions, so yay. Uh, and if you don't have Ubuntu or Gentoo, there's always a tarball. So go have fun. Um, Shorewall.net is their domain name, and uh, uh, there's all kinds of stuff there. So the first, when you're when you're setting up Shorewall, the easiest thing to do is in the documentation, they provide uh, sample configurations for some common uh, scenarios. First one is a is a one interface, so it's like one computer that's connected to the internet. College student type situation, not you know, uh, where you have a bunch of computers sitting behind the firewall. So this is, this is one computer, uh, and you just need a firewall on that computer. So they have a one interface uh, sample. <coughs> they have a two interface sample, which is the simple, I have a, a, a connection to the internet, and I have a local area network with, with machines on it. And then a three interface example that they have there is uh, 
connection to the internet, connection to the local area network, and a DMZ. Uh, using those, then you can, you can build on that. You can say, okay, I want to add a VPN zone, I want to add a DMZ, I want to add the Wi-Fi as a separate thing, and so forth. Let's go ahead and go to the next. Uh, once you have it installed uh, on, on uh, Red Hat or Enterprise Linux, you, you have to do a, a check config to turn it on, but it's not. This is one thing that always throws people. Even though the service is on, Shorewall will not actually start unless you change the uh, a line in the shorewall.conf that says startup enabled equals yes. Uh, out of the box it says startup enabled equals no. So it's a good thing to know. That's why I'm telling you. Um, you can use this uh, service shortcut if you didn't know about that. Uh, that's something Red Hat provides. It's the same thing as, as running the script uh, directly from Etsy and Etd. Uh, so you can just do ser uh, sudo service uh, and then your service name and then you can do your start and restart, reload, whatever. So uh, if you make a change to a configuration file uh, for Shorewall, all you have to do is do a reload and uh, it will check the syntax, make sure you haven't done anything boneheaded before it restarts so you're not stuck with a, a firewall that's dead. Uh, it will continue running with a good configuration until you fix um, your syntax error. Okay. So, zones. You can name your zones whatever you want. Shorewall uh, documentation provides some, some good common sense suggestions. Uh, net for the internet. So any of that traffic that's, that's coming in or going out to the, the wild, wild uh, internet, you just call that net. Uh, the firewall itself is F, FW. Uh, I don't quite understand it, but in some cases inside the shorewall configuration scripts they use the dollar sign FW. Um, I don't know enough to tell you why, but that's, that's what it is when you see it. Uh, LOC for the local network, uh, DMZ, uh, may, maybe a VPN, you know, those, those, these are the kind of names that you can come up with uh, with your zones. Let's go to the next, uh, configuring your zones. So all your, all your configuration files uh, for Shorewall are in Etsy Shorewall, um, and they're very common sense names. Zones is the file that contains the configuration for zones. Uh, and in fact, if you look in the samples directory, they have each of these files, uh, they have each of these files in a version that's very heavily annotated. So if you really want to understand every possible option that you can put in here, um, you can look through those files and it's just exhaustive. Um, but this, this file uh, has a little bit of a header there, but then the, the real meat is down here at the bottom. And this basically says the FW zone is the firewall. Um, the net zone is a IPv4 uh, zone and so, are the, so is the local zone and the DMZ. Now that brings up the, another question. Does Shorewall support IPv6? Yes, it does but I have never done it, so I can't tell you anything about it. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next one. So the next thing we want to do is, is say, okay, this zone is associated with this Ethernet interface, or this, you know, it's not just Ethernet. We, it can be uh, a VPN interface or a bonded interface, that sort of thing. Uh, so this file sets up the, uh, the zone to interface association. So here we have uh, net belongs to ETH0, uh, our local zone is ETH1, and uh, DMZ is ETH2. Then there's a bunch of options out here. And uh, when I gave this presentation before, this turned into a 10 minute discussion about what these options mean. So I made sure I read up on these. Uh, DHCP uh, just tells Shorewall that we're running, we're gonna be doing some DHCP traffic on, on over this interface. Uh, I think that's, in this case, we're connected to the to the internet, and so we have our we're going to be getting our address over DHCP from our ISP. Uh, the next the next question that comes up is Smurfs and Martians. Uh, we we hate Smurfs, so we have a no Smurfs here. Now, what Smurfs are are it's a it's a, uh, a network exploit that where the uh, source address is. From it's like it looks like it's coming from a broadcast address, mm -hmm. and so this is a way that uh, that 
malicious hackers will try to uh, do bad things though, and they try to mask their, their trail. Uh, Martians uh, are, it's traffic that's coming from someplace that shouldn't exist. Uh, for example, uh, an RFC 1918, which is like a, like a 192168 or a 10.block, that doesn't belong to you. If, if the tra if traffic comes in and it, and it looks like it's coming from a private uh, network and it's not yours, that's a Martian. So these are things that say, don't allow Smurfs. If we get some Martians, log them, that sort of thing. Um, and then I can't remember what the route filter does. There's, there's some options there. So anyway, uh, if you want to find out what all this means, you can either read that annotated sample file or you can type man shorewall dash interfaces. So all these configuration files are documented in, a, in their own man page. So shorewall dash interfaces gives you all the information you'd ever want to know about the interfaces file. Okay. So before we get in and start designating, you know, specifying specific rules, uh, we can set up some general policies about traffic from one zone to another. So in this case, we want all the traffic that originates in the local zone, so this is, you know, people's desktops uh, on the local area network, and going out to the net, we want, we want to accept those. We, we want the firewall to just let those go through. Um, then we have a blanket policy that says anything coming from the net to any other zone, drop it and maybe log it. And, and then this final policy is just reject everything. Now this is blanket policy and then we're going to create rules that override this. So this is, all, this is the fallback. <coughs> and again, if you want to know everything you can do in this file, do a man shorewall dash policy. Okay, so defining rules. They're in a file called rules. Uh, and the syntax for each of these rules is a macro name, usually. It's either a macro name or um, a rule of accept or drop or reject or something like that. And then uh, a source specification and a destination specification. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example. So here's some rules regarding ping <coughs> traffic. Ping, ICMP to just hit a server and the server is supposed to respond and say I got your ping. It's just a, a, a ping acknowledge. Uh, it's a great way to find out if a, if a remote box is alive. Um, sometimes if you're a really strict network administrator you'll block all ping because there's nobody, nobody's up to any good if they're pinging, right? Uh, they're only trying to find out what we've got so we'll just ignore their pings. I'm a little, little less strict. Uh, so in this case, this, uh, this first rule says we're going to drop anything from the net zone to our firewall. We don't want anybody out on the internet, the big bad evil internet, knowing that we exist. So we're going to drop the pings. Uh, meanwhile, we want anybody on the local network to be able to ping the firewall. If something's wrong, ping the firewall. <laughs> if they can't ping the firewall, you know, all hell breaks loose. Um, <clears throat> the DMZ should be able to ping the firewall. That's debatable. Uh, <clears throat> I'm surprised that this example has the, the, the DMZ can, can ping anything on the local network. Or, uh, but there's some, there's some examples, and, and certainly that's how you would ex expect, uh, this is how uh, the rules are formatted. The very first one doesn't have a macro, so this ping is an example of a macro, and that's defined somewhere else. It basically says it's ICMP, and it, it uses this syntax, and uh, the, it, it basically defines uh, certain specifics about the protocol itself. This one up here basically says <clears throat> anything from the firewall going out to the net using the ICMP protocol, which can be ping, and there's a few other different, I can't remember, ping's the only one that comes to mind right now. Some of you network geeks can think of some others. So. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, let's say we, uh, 
we want to uh, restrict traffic, SSH traffic, except from one specific <coughs> host on the internet. This is how we specify that with the zone name, colon, and then the IP address. So this says we're accepting any SSH traffic from this IP address, which is, uh, I think that's X Mission's DNS server, um, to our firewall. Next one says uh, we're going to accept anything from our local network to the firewall so that our people can SSH to the firewall. And uh, we want people on the local network to be able to connect to uh, other internet systems via SSH. I wish they'd let us do that, Bluehost, but they don't. So, okay, let's go next. Okay, here we go. Port numbers. Um, here's the scenario you're running a Quake server on your firewall. Everybody does that, right? So in this, in this scenario, we have a, uh, a server that's running on the firewall uh, <clears throat> on port 27500. So we want people on the internet to be able to connect to that. So this says accept from the net to the firewall, protocol UDP, port number 27500. Now, I could go out and create a macro file, and those are stored in user share shorewall. Shorewall, I think it's. I think that's where. It, there's a directory on the system that has all your macro files. So I could go in there and create a macro file that says, if you call a macro called Quake, this is this is what the Quake protocol looks like, and and then we could just say Quake accept uh, net FW. And that, that could be DMZ, for example, instead of FW. Right. Which would make more sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, another thing that you typically want to do with firewalls is port forwarding, especially if, you're, uh, if you have a home-based firewall. You have one IP, uh, and you want to be able to get some traffic back behind that one IP. Uh, you might, in this case, uh, uh, you want somebody to be able to connect to the IP address that belongs to your firewall, um, but in reality, that traffic's being forwarded to some, some machine on the local network. In this case, uh, we've got VNC. Uh, we're using this DNAT as an action to say, forward the port to this, to this, uh, to this host. Down here is another one. We're doing a, a straight DNAT rather than a macro. This one... Uh, if they're connecting to port 5000 on the firewall, it's going to send it to this local IP, port 80. That makes sense? Okay. Yeah, it's really not a, a difficult thing to, to grasp. The, the syntax is pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, IP masquerading. Now, uh, Shorewall defines masquerading as uh, when the external interface is uh, dynamic in a sense that you get that you it, it's not a static IP mm -hmm. and uh, source netting or snat is uh, when the external interface is specified so it's a static IP um, and then the Etsy shorewall mask file basically says that uh, what what private subnet is is being translated behind your public uh, IP. Okay. You have more than one. Hmm? <clears throat> can you have more than one? Can you have more? I uh, yes, you can have more than one private I, uh, private subnet. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. That's. Um, this is a little beyond the scope of our presentation, but uh, I'll, I'll rush through it really quick. Doing open v VPN through the shore wall. Um, first thing you would do is, is add the VPN zone. Uh, you would, then you would add the uh, interface. Uh, OpenVPN uses a TUN device, a TUN device on, on the system. Um, so then you would set that up as an interface and associate it with the zone. Uh, and then you, you create this tunnels file um, that basically says OpenVPN is running on this port. Traffic's going to be coming in through the network. <clears throat> and I don't remember what this does, but I think you can restrict it to certain IPs this way. And then you can add some rules that, you know, are uh, 
specify how Shorewall is supposed to accept or restrict traffic from that zone or to that zone. Okay, what's next? Okay, for more info, go to shorewall.net. Excellent man pages that I talked to you about. Each of those configuration files. Like if you want to find out more about the tunnels file, man shorewall tunnels. And, and the example configurations are in your docs in a directory called sample. So be something like uh, user, uh, user share docs shorewall dash whatever version slash samples. And there we go. Any questions? Good. That means I explained it really well or not very well at all. So uh, how well does Shorewall fit in? Uh, does Shorewall fit in with any of the graphical firewalls? Like, I mean, I use PFSense, so I admin it all through a web interface. Is there uh, some kind of a web type interface for Shorewall if you're doing that as a firewall? I would imagine there probably is, but I've never used it. I can do it all with I mean, VI. It really yeah, it is really simple. But, yeah. um, now, PFSense is BSD, right? Yes. Okay. And this is very much uh, very much Linux because it's basically sitting on top of, it's meant to make it easier to manage all this chaos that is in the Linux kernel. If I remember correctly, IP might have been based on I'm trying to remember now. The, the, the IP Linux distribution was based on the I, I should find out if there's some uh, graphical ways to set up Shorewall. It seems like uh, it would be pretty easy to do, but if you've got Vim and sudo. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, that's it. Thank you.